So we have this ad that we run on Facebook and Instagram that converts like crazy. All it says is, how did Emma and Sam sell $14,000 worth of product in just seven days? They used strategy number three. If Emma and Sam can do it, so can you. Free up your shelves and move stock fast by clicking the button below. That's it. It's literally three lines long. But we have had over 10,000 people download those strategies. So today, I'm going to tell you how Emma and Sam sold $14,000 worth of product in just seven days. Welcome to the Bringing Business to Retail podcast, where I, Selena Knight, share strategies, interview retail revolutionaries, and delve into the minds of e-commerce experts to help you grow a profitable, independent retail or e-commerce business. If you're stuck in a rut, or if you feel like business is way harder than it should be, or you've overachieved all of the things that you've set out to and are wondering what to do next, or how do I even make this better? I know that you're going to love today's episode. If you're stuck in a rut, feel like business is way harder than it should be, or you've achieved all of the things that you set out to and are wondering what next, or how do I even make this better? Then I know that you're going to love today's episode. Hey there, and welcome to the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. I'm your host, Selena Knight, and today I'm going to tell you the answer to the question that over 10,000 people want to know. Yep, how did Emma and Sam make $14,000 with just a few social media posts in less than seven days? In fact, the response to that ad has been so big that I decided that we needed to do something more. I mean, I can give you the strategies that they used, which is what we do in that download, but it's so important to know to know that this is just a symptom. It is not the problem. And we need to educate retail and e-commerce store owners of the problem. So I jumped in last week and I created an exclusive training on how to clear out aged inventory so that you can boost your cash flow. Nothing out of the ordinary. It's the kind of thing that we do week in, week out. But then something funny happened. Today, we had our wrap-up call for Scale Your Store Live, and we were talking about 90-day planning. Once we finished the conversation, it turned to having too much inventory. It is one of the key things that we talk about inside of the money pillar, because if you've got too much stock, then it's costing you a lot of money. We talked about why you've got to get rid of it, the types of offers that drive our clients to buy, and of course, the strategies that you can use to move that idle stock. So we talked about this inside of the money pillar a few weeks ago. And I have to say, every time we go through Scale Your Store, there's, it's like there's this collective aha moment. Everybody is at different places in their business journey. But somehow, every time we go through Scale Your Store Live, there is one thing that everybody just seems to go like mind blown. And this time around, it was old stock or aged inventory or idle inventory, whatever you want to call it, but stuff that is sitting on your shelves, costing you money. And we talk about the different ways that it costs you money inside of Scale Your Store, but probably the easiest way to sum it up was when one of our Scale Your Storers said to us on the call today, while my money is tied up, I'm not restocking my bread and butter products that I know sell because I simply don't have the cash flow. I mean, if you are losing sales because you don't have the products that sell day in and day out, that is a huge cost to your business, obviously financially, but also a huge cost to your reputation. Because if customers are expecting that you have those bread and butter items and they're not there, over and over again, when they come to your website or come into your store, they're going to go somewhere else. And I'll have to admit, when I started out in business, this was a huge trap for me. Have I ever told you the story about the green dresses? 
if you've been around me for a while, I've probably mentioned this story because it's one of those things where when you look back on it, you literally like slap your forehead and go, how could I be so dumb? Honestly, it's not that you're dumb. It's just that you don't know any better, right? You don't know what you don't know. So let me tell you the story about the green dresses. We used to manufacture. So if you don't know, I owned a chain of eco baby boutiques. So we specialized in sustainable baby products and maternity products. And we used to manufacture these beautiful little girls pinafores. And they were very simple, very, but just very whimsical. They sold like no tomorrow. And I, I love them. I love that we had to have, we, we got to have creativity, having different patterns. I love that customers love them. We made, we ended up making them reversible. So much happened with those dresses. And because we were having them manufactured by some, some local people, we were able to do reasonably short runs of different fabrics. So we used to have to get maybe a hundred done. And so I brought some fabric in and I used to get fabric from all over the world. And I brought this fabric in that had looked gorgeous online. It was a minty colored green, it had sort of white clouds with little patterns on it. It looked gorgeous. Even when it arrived, I still liked it. But when it turned up made into a dress, I hated them. I thought they were the ugliest things I had ever seen in the world and nobody would buy them. In fact, I was embarrassed that I had made such a huge mistake. Like, I'm not saying that I'm a professional designer, but I kind of have an eye for color and design when it comes to things like this. And I'd been doing this for years. So in my mind, it was a complete failure. I'd spent $1,000 getting them made and I didn't want anybody to see them. So I literally put them into a garbage bag, tied them up, took them into the storeroom and our storeroom had shelving that went right up to the roof and it was really high. And on that top, top shelf, that was where we kept things like postage, like all the extra stuff you don't need very often, postage boxes, extra things of bubble wrap, oh yeah, the Christmas tree, all that kind of stuff. And so I have this garbage bag full of dresses. It was pretty big, but I was also too lazy to go and get the ladder. So I literally picked up the bag and there was this huge box sitting there. And I was like, I reckon I could lob this bag into the box. I make a little fun out of it, right? So I did, picked it up, threw it as hard as I could, and it lands in the box. Yay, my big failure is hidden. No one needs to know about it. I delete them out of the POS and no one is any the wiser. So fast forward oh, about six, maybe eight months later, one of my gorgeous team members, Tanya, was in the stock room and it had been raining for weeks on end. Given that we're a baby store, people don't generally like to take their babies out when it is pouring down with rain. So things were a little quiet. But having a great team member means having great initiative. So Tanya decided to clean out the stock room from top to bottom. She started at the top. You know what was at the top, don't you? This giant box filled with green dresses. Dozens and dozens and dozens of these green dresses. I'd completely forgotten about them. And to be fair, I didn't even know that she was cleaning out the stock room. But I came into the store a couple of days later. I walk in and front and centre are these hideous green dresses. I mean, she had put them in the windows. She had put them everywhere. And I, I walked in and I looked at her and I, she was like, oh my God, I have had the best day. I was cleaning out the stock room the other day and I found this giant bag full of these pinafores. They are so beautiful. She was just gushing about the fact that she thought the best thing in the world had happened. There's like thousands of dollars worth of stock sitting here. She'd put them out. She'd put them into the POS. She'd taken a photo. She'd uploaded it to the website and she'd even already sold half a dozen of them. Now, what does that say to me? One, maybe my taste isn't the same as my customers. But two, there was $4,000, maybe $5,000 worth of stock sitting in that box 
for six to eight months. That is four to $5,000 that I couldn't use to buy stuff that my customers wanted to buy. That's four to $5,000 that I couldn't use to replace my bread and butter lines. It's four to $5,000 that I couldn't use to get extra seasonal stock in, to try out new products. And if you think about it very, very simplistically, let's call it $5,000. If I was using that $5,000 every 30 days to buy new product, in six months that that stuff had been sitting there, that was $30,000 of potential lost revenue. All because my big fat ego got in the way of doing business. That is one of those moments I can look back on and say, I was acting like an overworked, underpaid shopkeeper, not a retail CEO. Because if I was acting like a CEO, I would have done everything I could to move that stock out and to get my cash flow in. Okay, so that was the story about me. I'm going to tell you the story about Emma and Sam in just a moment, I promise. But here's the thing. You have to make these kinds of financial decisions from a CEO mindset. You have to make them based on facts and numbers, not on guesswork. You can't be guessing how much stock you need. You can't be guessing what products are selling and which products aren't. You can't be guessing how much you need to order when you put in your next supplier order. You have to make these decisions based on numbers. And I mentioned that today in the Scale Your Store call, and one of the ladies went, oh, I just kind of order what I think we need. It was a light bulb moment for her. She realized that that could be one of the key contributors to having too much idle stock sitting in her business, which is costing her literally tens of thousands of dollars. The great thing is she's already moved to that CEO mindset and she knew that in order to make great decisions when it comes to selecting the right products and which products to keep and which products to get rid of, she knew that our perfect product matrix, honestly, this is a seriously simple exercise that we do inside of Scale Your Store, where we map out where products sit on our customer's value ladder and our profit ladder. So when we put all this together, you can see how many of your products are high volume, high margin, high volume, low margin, low volume, low margin. And you can get a realistic picture of what do you need more of in your business and what do you need less of in your business and what needs to go stat. So she knew that the first step in cashing in on this aged inventory was to work out what needed to go and what they needed to replace it with. Those are CEO decisions, not shopkeeper decisions. They're decisions that you make based on knowledge, not on guesswork. Okay, so let me tell you about Emma and Sam. So Emma and Sam were one-on-one clients who I worked with for Strategic Growth Consulting, and they sell wedding decor. So think those personalized acrylic name plates that you put at place settings. They sold wishing wells. They sold bunting, table decorations, all that wedding kind of stuff. And I walked into their store. Well, it wasn't even a store. They had like a small shop front that they used if customers came to collect things with some displays, but it was more of a sort of warehouse situation with that little kind of bit of retail out the front. And so I walked in and there was a long corridor that went down the side. There was a little room out the front, long corridor, and then there was kitchen and then there was offices and storeroom and whatnot. And as I'm walking down, there are these big boxes piled all the way to the ceiling and the whole corridor, which had to be like 10 meters long, that's 30 feet long, is piled high with these boxes, floor to ceiling. I think there were something like 45 boxes all down this hallway. Big, big boxes. And so as I'm walking down, I was like, oh, delivery day. And they said, oh, yeah, we had to move those out of the stock room because we just got a delivery. So I look at all these boxes. They're all stamped with the same product, acrylic wishing wells. So I turned to Emma and Sam, bearing in mind, this is the first time that we've met in person and say, 
wow, you guys must sell a lot of acrylic wishing wells. And they look at each other and they look back at me and say, no, we don't. We've had those moving around the warehouse for about the last six months. Every time a delivery gets comes in, we have to move them because they take up so much space, but we can't sell them because they've got some scratches on them. Now, normally acrylic products come with plastic shrink wrapped over the top of them. For some reason, these products didn't. And so they had rubbed against each other in transport and they had some very, very minor marking and wear on them. And I'm looking at these boxes. I'm looking at Emma and Sam. I'm like, how much money is in those boxes? They look at each other. They look back at me and they say it was around a $30,000 order. $30,000 worth of slightly bruised acrylic wishing wells for six months sitting in boxes in a corridor. Needless to say, our first implementation plan was to get rid of that stock because things were tight for Emma and Sam. And who wouldn't have that same situation? If you've just spent $30,000 on an order of product that you can't sell, well, most people can't afford to have that much money tied up in inventory. Now, you might not have dozens of boxes of acrylic wishing wells sitting in your corridor, but if you're like most retailers I meet, there's a pretty good chance that you are making the exact same mistake as Emma and Sam were, and that you have tens of thousands of dollars wrapped up in stock that is collecting dust on your shelves. But here's the thing, because you may not have those dozens of boxes in the corridor, it may not be as obvious for you. But maybe you might connect with some of the things, some of the excuses that Emma and Sam gave me for having all of that money tied up in the inventory. The first one was they didn't have a sales section on their website because they didn't want to be seen as cheap or having inferior products. Now guys, every single brand has stuff they need to get rid of. Whether you have a hidden section on your website, whether you have an in-store sale, or you have a sales section on your website for all to see, the fact is you have to get rid of stuff that doesn't move. I mean, even Apple, who don't discount their products, have a refurbished section on their website where you can buy products That could be perceived as being inferior or not top quality. It doesn't hurt the Apple brand. All it's doing is providing their product to someone who maybe couldn't afford it at full price. We call those the aspirational customers and they should never be neglected because they can become your drum beaters and your boomerangs, the people who tell everybody about you and come back again and again. So just like I had had that moment where I let my ego get in the way and I let my own self-worth get tied up in my products, so had Emma and Sam. They didn't want to sell this stuff because they didn't want their brand to be seen as inferior or cheap and they didn't want to admit that they'd made a mistake. They'd made a mistake by not confirming that the products had been shrink-wrapped before they were dispatched and they'd made a mistake by accepting inferior goods from their supplier. Now, all of those things can make you feel pretty crap about yourself. But guys, this is business. Stuff like this happens. A CEO sorts it out and moves on. Doesn't let $30,000 worth of stock sit in a corridor. You can't let your own identity be tied up in the value of your goods or your store. You are so much more than your business, okay? All right, so what did Emma and Sam do to get that stock gone? Well, first of all, we put a target in place. The target was 50% of stock. And we actually said 50% of stock moved within two weeks. And then we had to put a system in place. What were we going to do to get rid of it. Now, you can imagine there are a lot of barriers here that we had to push through because of those feelings that came with this, in their terms, inferior stock. 
Now, all of this was actually needless because they simply put up a few posts into their VIP Facebook group and sold nearly half of that stock in seven days. Of course, they sold it at a discount, but there were literally hundreds of people who really wanted this product but couldn't afford it at the full price. And they were totally happy to deal with a few slight scratches that made it not quite perfect. So all of these hang-ups that, that Emma and Sam had in their own head were only theirs, not their customers. And I think that's something else that we forget, that we are not our best customer. We are not our ultimate customer. So we can't put our own biases onto what our customers are thinking, what they're feeling and what they value. Right about now, I'm guessing you have probably brought in a lot of stock for the holiday period. And that's a smart move. It's time to cash in on people who want to spend. Maybe you need to make up for some of the downturn that you've potentially gone through. But right now, if ever there was a time to make money, it's during this holiday season. So smart retailers would have forecasted what they needed, what their customer wanted, and have a bunch of new stock ready to sell. But as you already know, there's a chance that some of that stock isn't going to move. So you need to have a plan in place to make sure that once we get through this holiday period, you know when that stock's time is up and how to get it out the door so that you can use that cash flow to continue to grow your business. So I mentioned at the start of this episode that I actually had gone and created a training just last week talking all about this subject. And it's the kind of training that I would only normally give to my Scalia store or my one-on-one -on -one clients. Or if it's something that I'm going to sell, I'd probably charge around $100 for it. I don't do that often, but every now and then we'll put together an exclusive training that we sell for retailers. But after this kind of kismet moment where I made the training and then we talked about it in Scale Your Store Live, it made me realize that this is something that so many of you can benefit from right now. If you want to discover the three main reasons that your stock isn't moving, and if you want to know the formula that I use and that I teach my Scalia stores and my one-on-one -on -one clients to know when you need to move that stock. And of course, the strategies that you can implement to get that stock gone fast, then this, my friend, is for you. But I'm not going to charge $80 or $100 for it. But I am going to charge for it because I know that people who actually pull out their credit card no matter if it's for $1 or $100 or $1,000, the people who actually go through the motion and put their credit card details in actually have a better chance of taking action and getting results. So if this is something that you know is an issue for your business, if you're looking around your shelves or your storeroom and thinking, I'd really like to cash in on all of the money that is tied up in that idle inventory, then I'm going to give it to you for less than the price of a nice gourmet sandwich. I'm not going to charge you $80 or $100. I'm going to give it to you for less than $10. Now, for most of you, all you would have to do is sell one thing using the information that you learn inside of this training and you've made your money back. It's a no brainer. Anything else you sell after that first product is cash in the bank. It's just going to continue to increase your return on investment. So I'll pop a link up to that in the show notes, but also over at selenanight.com forward slash inventory. Honestly, I'm not sure how long we'll keep that up for, but we'll put it up through the holiday season. So if you're listening to this, you can jump in and grab that training for less than $10 and you can find out why your stock isn't moving, when you need to get rid of it, and how you can get rid of it fast. All of that is over at selenanight.com forward slash inventory. So I just want to finish up with a bit of a reality check. There's no guarantee that if you go and post your idle inventory into a Facebook group, 
that you're going to make $14,000 in seven days. You already know that, right? Emma and Sam were just lucky to have a really big Facebook group of a lot of brides-to-be who loved what they sold, but maybe didn't have the cash to buy exactly what they wanted. It was a little bit of luck, but it was also the right message and the right offer to the right person at the right time. You might have to implement more than one strategy to get that old stock moving, but you also need to know what your customer values when it comes to offers. So inside of that Scale Your Store call today, we talked about the difference between having a product at 50% off and having a buy one, get one free. And this was like a light bulb moment for the people on the call because 50% off makes a product feel cheap. It makes it feel like it wasn't the best quality. But buy one, get one free is value driven. I feel like I'm getting more, not getting less. That's one of the things that we talk about inside the marketing pillar inside of Scale Your Store. But that's just a very simplified example. The right offer to the right person at the right time is key to moving this stock for you. But we've all got to start somewhere. And that somewhere is with you stepping up and being the CEO of your business and making financial decisions based on numbers and facts and knowledge, not guesswork. And I'll show you how to step up and take control with that exclusive training over at selenanight.com forward slash inventory. Okay, that wraps up today's episode. Uh, Just a sneak peek that next week, I'll be letting you behind the scenes of some of the things that we talked about in Scaling Your Store Live 2021. So make sure you check in and get that little behind the scenes look into what happens. Alrighty, I'll see you back here at the same time next week. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. You can find all of the show notes over at selenanight.com. If you found something that you heard today particularly useful, I'd love it if you could leave me a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And of course, feel free to share this episode with someone that you think could benefit by listening to it. Want more retail biz strategies? You can watch the Bringing Business to Retail TV show where each week I'll answer a question or provide you with a simple, actionable retail biz strategy that you can implement in your business right away. If you have a question or a guest, I'd love to hear from you. Drop my team an email at podcast at selenanight.com and I'll see you on the next episode. Have a great week.